Hi, uh, I'm Art Bergeron and welcome to seminar number six of the Elder Law 101 series that I started, that I've been go doing since the beginning of this year and that is going to go through the end of the year. Uh, we've already gone through talking about my friends Frank and Mary and dealing with incapacity and estate planning before age 60. That was the first one. The next one we did things to consider in your 60s, then things to consider in your 70s. Back in, uh, back in April, we, we talked about taxes. In May, we talked about life in your 80s. Uh, in this month, June, we're talking about uh, how to deal about the fact that you can always qualify for mass health. You can always qualify for mass health and why that is. Uh, as usual, I'm talking about my friends uh, Frank and Mary and their kids, Peter, Paul, and Mary Jr. Uh, Frank and Mary's assets in this, in this uh, example, uh, they have a house, if they live in Metro West, that's worth about $400,000. Frank's IRA is worth about two hundred. dollars They have joint savings of two hundred. dollars so they have total assets of about $800,000. Frank's Social Security is $2,000 a month. Mary's is $1,000 a month. Uh, if these same people, as many people know, I, I do a lot of work here in Metro West and also on the islands, on Martha's Vineyard and Nantucket. These, the exact same numbers apply in Martha's Vineyard in Nantucket, except for the house, which on those islands is probably worth closer to a million one than it is to $400,000. I have the same basic clients in Metro West that I have on the islands. The only difference is on the island, most of them are millionaires because of their house. Um, so we're going to talk about, in that case, in that situation, and by the way, we're also going to talk about um, Mary's sister Peg and Peg's daughter Peggy because Peg is single, uh, and so, and Peggy is the designated daughter because she's the only daughter, and they, they have similar questions, though, as, as Peg is getting older about dealing with mass health. So, Peg in Metro West is the very same as Frank and Mary, uh, and, is, and Peg on the islands is the very same as Frank and Mary on the islands. We're going to be talking about them later. So, I'm going to focus first on Mary's situation if she needs nursing home care while Frank and she are both alive. So if Mary, if Mary needs to go to a nursing home today uh, with the assets that Frank and Mary have, the question is how can she qualify for mass health? And she's going to want to qualify for mass health um, because if she doesn't, if she's on private pay, she's going to be paying in that nursing home probably closer and closer to $16,000 a month. That's kind of where the prices are around Metro West and I know that's, that's the price at, at our island home uh, on Nantucket. It's about the price at, at, uh, at uh, Windermere uh, on Martha's Vineyard. So the question is, how can she qualify for mass health? Well, because Frank is alive, Mary can qualify for mass health almost immediately while having practically no effect on any of their assets. Um, in order for Mary to qualify, she needs to show that she has less than $2,000 in countable assets. She could actually own the home. Uh, and qualify for mass health, but mass health would put a lien on it. But in this case, because Frank's still alive, uh, if Mary and Frank own the home jointly, Mary can still qualify for mass health, uh, and they would, and mass health would not lien the home. If Frank just owns the house individually, this is what we would recommend. Once again, Mary can simply qualify for mass health because, because they're married. Uh, for Mary to qualify, she has to have less than two thousand dollars. But Frank can own the home. Frank and other can have other cash or cash equivalent assets equal to up to $148,600. And Frank can have unlimited income. That third one's really important because most people assume if they're couples, they've got any kind of savings, that they can't qualify for mass health. Incorrect. Um, so basically, Mary's strategy in order to qualify for mass health, even if she just went to the nursing home and they had not done any planning ahead of time, would be to move all assets to Frank. There is no look back period regarding transfers between spouses. So this can be done the day before she wants to qualify for mass health. Frank at that point, given the assets that he has, uh, would keep the house of course, and the house wouldn't be countable. We already talked about that. I would advise him probably to keep say $100,000 of his $400,000 in remaining assets. Use the rest of the money, the money to buy an annuity. So that annuity would cost him about $300,000. Um, and the day after Mary Frank buys that annuity, thereby reducing the remaining assets to below 148,600, Mary qualifies for mass health. And she will continue to be eligible for mass health as long as that amount that Frank has kept 
is less than $48,600. And by the way, once Mary is on MassHealth, that amount can be in excess of $148,600. As I always say, in situations like this, the day after Mary actually gets on MassHealth, Frank can hit the lottery. Um, so once she's on, Mary's income, which is $1,000 a month, will go to the nursing home, um, minus some very small adjustments. MassHealth will pay all the rest. So you can see in this case, there is a big incentive for Mary to qualify for MassHealth, and she can do it quickly because all assets can be shifted to Frank quickly. Ideally, in this situation, Mary has executed a power of attorney naming Frank or somebody in the family uh, as her agent so that that person has the ability on her behalf to transfer these assets to Frank. So, the only question regarding all of this is what kind of annuity? Many of you have annuities. Uh, often they are annuities which have a surrender value. It, it, where you can cash in the annuity at any time and get money for it. That's not the kind of annuity that we're talking about. If you have an annuity with a surrender value, then the amount of the surrender value is actually a countable asset. The annuity that Frank would want to buy is one that calls for equal monthly payments over a term that is shorter than Frank's actuarial life expectancy at the time. If, for example, Frank, is in, Frank in the example that we're using is about 80 years old, in that case, Frank's life expectancy is around, around 19 years. Mary's life expectancy is about 20 years. Uh, excuse me, Frank's life expectancy is, 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 yeah, Mary's life expectancy is just a little bit over Frank's. So um, the, point, the point is that the, the annuity has to be for a term that is shorter than Frank's actuarial life expectancy. It can be much shorter, and we're gonna talk about that in a few minutes, but it has to be shorter. The annuity has to say that once it starts, he cannot cash in that annuity early. Um, he can name uh, his kids, Peter, Paul, and Mary uh, Jr. as the death beneficiaries of that annuity, except that if Mary it qualifies for MassHealth and MassHealth starts paying uh, and to covering that nursing home care, and then Frank dies, whether it is before or after Mary dies, if he dies before he has received all the payments on that annuity, MassHealth will have a, a lien on those remaining payments. That's the reason why we would recommend in this case that Frank keep that annuity short. We'd say instead of having an annuity that's going to go for 10 years, think about maybe an annuity for like four years, an annuity for a fairly short period of time so that he can get all of his money back. Because remember, even though he's going to be getting these big annuity payment checks every month, as soon as Mary is on Mass Health, those checks can accumulate to more than $148,600. It won't make any difference. Finally, th and this really relates to Frank and Mary's more global asset protection strategy. Uh, e even if they're both healthy, if people like Frank and Mary come to me and talk about what to do to protect themselves in the event that somebody needs nursing home care, what I'll tell them to do is have wills have both of them have wills that say, if I die, any of the assets that I own at the time of my death are going, instead of going to my spouse, if she's still alive or he is still alive, are gonna go and trust for the benefit of my spouse and we're gonna name one of the kids as the trustees. As long as things are structured that way, all of the assets owned by the first spouse to die will be safe, non-countable and non-leanable the, if the surviving spouse needs to qualify for mass health. In Frank and Mary's current situation, where all assets have been transferred to him, I would recommend that will so that any cash that he has, as well as the house, if he dies suddenly, will, will through his will, go into trust for Mary's benefit. Those assets will be safe, non-countable, and non-leanable, uh, even if Mary stays in the nursing home for the rest of her life, right? So the point is, there's a clear strategy if Frank and Mary are both alive. What happens though if Frank has died uh, and, and those wills were not in place or they were in place but Mary still had some assets when Frank died? What can Mary do then? Remember Mary in Metro West, uh, we'll assume that she has all of the assets, has that house, she has now Frank's IRA, they had joint savings, she's got $800,000 in assets, right? On the islands, she's got a million five in assets because of the, incre because of the, the substantial value of the house. What can Mary do? And by the way, in this situation, where, where Frank has died, has not 
through his will, put all of the assets into trust for Mary so that Mary actually has control of the assets. Mary's strategy right now is exactly the same as her, si as her sister Peg's strategy, dealing with what happens if Peg later needs to go to a nursing home. What sh she needs to be dealing with the fact that now these assets are going to be exposed because if she has more than $2,000 in countable assets, something's gonna to have to be done with them. So her, her initial strategy, as long as she's still healthy and not needing to go to a nursing home or already in one, would be she can give away those assets, but then she's gonna to have to wait five years before those assets are gonna become non-countable. That's the famous five-year look-back period. While transfers to your spouse are not subject to a look-back period, transfers to anybody else, and when I say transfers, I mean gifts, and gifts are defined as transfers for less than fair market value. So whenever I hear my, my uh, client say, well, I'll just give my, my child my house for a dollar. Well, no, that's actually, that's, that's, that really is a gift. Even if you sell it to them for a dollar, that's a gift. Any transfer for less than fair market value is a gift. So what Mary would be wanting to do, or Peg, if, if you, Peg is just single, would be give things away and wait five years. Regarding her home, what she would probably want to do is give away a so-called remainder interest in the house, that is the interest that starts after she dies. She would keep a life estate in the house, that is control of the house for as long as she, as long as she was alive. Five years after she had done that, the remainder interest that she had given away would no longer be countable or lienable if Mary needed to qualify for Mass Health. Mass Health would put a lien on her life estate, but at the moment of her death, her life estate and therefore the lien would evaporate so that her child uh, or whoever she gave the property to would be able to get the property lien free. So she could give away an interest in her house, probably a remainder interest and keep a life estate, and she could give away all of the rest of her money. It's important to note here that as contrary to popular myth, there is no gift tax. So Mary could, in this case, take her $400,000 and simply give them away to one of her kids, and there would be no gift tax regarding that. The only problem for Mary is that because some of the money that she has is an IRA, remember she inherited a $200,000 IRA from Frank, which she probably converted to her own IRA, she's going to have to pay income tax on that money before she can give it away. And, and incidentally, that's why one of the, the broader mass health asset protection strategies for a single person, especially if you have a lot of accumulated tax deferred money, IRAs or, or, or uh, 401k money, is to give it away gradually. Every, give some away every year. Don't just take your required minimum distribution every year. Take a larger amount of money, but an amount that's not gonna push you into a very high federal tax bracket so that you can reduce the, po the, likely, the possibility that you need to transfer all the money at the same time in order to qualify for mass health, or in, in, in this case, in order to protect it from mass health and have to pay a very large income tax. So the point is, Mary's basic strategy is give it all away. To whom? Well, if Mary only had one child, like Peg and Peggy, Peg could just give all of her assets to Peggy. She could give the, Peggy a remainder interest in the house. She could give Peggy all of the other money right? She would have had to pay the income tax regarding the IRA, but then five years and a day after she had done that, all those assets would be safe, non-countable, non-lienable. Of course, she would have to trust Peggy and, and trust that Peggy, while, while, Mary was while Peg, the mother, was alive, was going to keep these assets aside so that if, Mary, if Peg really needed them, Peggy would transfer them back. For situations where people have multiple children, the most common way that this gets handled is by, having a, a, by creating an irrevocable trust. What is an irrevocable trust? An irrevocable trust is one from which you cannot take things back out once you've put them in, as opposed to a revocable trust, a trust that you continue to have complete control over and can take things out of at any time. This has to be an irrevocable trust the kids or somebody other than Mary or Peg have to be the trustee. The trust can say that while, in this case, Mary is alive, assets can always be distributed to one of the kids. And the trust would then say that following Mary's death, any remaining assets that were in trust would get distributed among the kids. Uh, this would, you, Mary would only do this if she was sure that whoever she had named as that trustee 
if Mary needed the money, would give the money to herself to the, or to one of the other beneficiaries so that that beneficiary could turn around and give it back to Mary. As, as I always tell my clients, that's why they call them trusts. You have to trust the trustee. But if you do, um, and you're willing to take that chance, then by giving those assets away, even either to an individual or to the trustee of that irrevocable trust, Mary is protecting all the assets. The question though, and this is one that actually showed up again today, where it is, was what happened if, if Mary didn't do any of that? If Mary didn't want to lose control of her assets and was positive that she was just going to drop dead and was never going to go to a nursing home, except that now she's in one and she has a house and she has those assets. Mary's got a house worth, worth on, in Metro West 400,000 and, and an IRA that's now hers worth 200, a bank account worth 200 for a total of 800. Mary's social security check now is $2,000 a month. It used to be 1,000, but Frank died and now she gets uh, Frank's instead. Uh, uh, and what if she needs nursing home care, right? What, first of all, what would happen in that situation? Well, one possibility for Mary, because she hadn't given her assets all away, is she could simply pay the nursing home for the rest of her life, right? And if she, at, at, a, at a cost which is typically around here, as I mentioned, migrating toward $16,000 a month, it's higher than that in some places, lower than that in most places, but that's where the, the number kind of is right now. Uh, if, for example, Mary did that and lived for four years, then during that time, the total nursing home bill would be $768,000. During that time, as we mentioned, Mary's income would be $2,000 a month. In this situation, she wouldn't have any other expenses because she'd just be going to the, she'd be in the nursing home. So we're assuming that Mary's $2,000 a month would be available to pay the nursing home. Therefore, her burn rate, the rate at which her other assets would need to be used up um, in, in order to pay the nursing home would be $672,000. What would be left at the end of uh, four years? Well, if Mary were in Metro West, so remember her total assets were worth $800,000, what would be left would be $128,888. If she were on the islands, what would be left would be $828,000 because the house is worth so much more. But in either case, Mary's goal like Frank's goal, which was to give their assets, which they had spent a lot of time working to save to their kids, is really being defeated because all of this money has to be redirected to a nursing home, which, she, which they never wanted to do. So the question is then, could Mary instead of that qualify for mass health? Because if she can, look what happens. Once Mary is on mass health, that nursing home rate drops from the private pay rate for that very same bed in that very same facility. And that private pay rate tends to run, once again, close to $16,000 a month to around $8,000 a month. Now this varies by nursing home because just like on the private sector, the, the private rates are vary from nursing home to her, nursing home. Similarly, MassHealth negotiates different rates with every single nursing home. So this is gonna vary a little bit. But based on a lot of experience, I can tell you that typically that mass health rate is around $8,000 a month. So look what then happens if Mary is on mass health so that the nursing home cost is $8,000 a month. At that rate, over four years in the nursing home, or 48 months, Mary will pay $384,000 minus the $2,000 per month that she's been getting in, in, um, in Social Security which if she were on MassHealth, she'd be needing to pay to the nursing home, means that the, that the burn rate on the remaining assets would be $288,000. At the end of four years, what would be left if she were in Metro West? $512,000. If she were on the island, $1,212,000. So the, the, the benefit, not to Mary, because she's gonna be in that same nursing home in that same bed, but to the kids, is really substantial. So the question is, can Mary or Peg qualify for Mass Health? And the answer is yes. They can do that by doing something with the cash, the $400,000. Mary and, and Peg can, can own the house and qualify for Mass Health, with an exception, and I'm going to talk about that. But regarding the cash, they have to reduce the cash below $2,000. The question is, how do they do that? They have two alternatives. One 
is Mary could put the money into something called the D4C pooled trust. What in the world is that? Well, the three, the, 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 the letter number letter, D4C, are actually the last three letters of a part of the federal Medicaid statute that allows this to happen. I won't go into more detail. If you want to learn more about pooled trust in general, just Google that term, pooled trust, or Google Plan of Massachusetts and Rhode Island, one of the five that, uh, pooled trusts that are run in Massachusetts it is by the Plan of Massachusetts, whose, whose goal is, as their logo says, preserve assets, protect benefits, live well. Once the money has been transferred into the pooled trust, it can be used for Mary's benefit. The rules for qualifying? Well, first of all, the funds that are transferred into the pooled trust, it, the day that they get transferred are no longer, the day after, are no longer countable for purposes of figuring out whether Mary qualifies for MassHealth. That rule, MassHealth was considering changing that rule. It may change in the future, so we're going to stay in touch with this, but for the time being, these transfers are all still valid. There is no look back period regarding these transfers. So the transfers can be made today, and if they reduce Mary's assets below $2,000, Mary can qualify tomorrow. There is, however, a mass health lien on the remaining assets. So we want so so you say, well, why am I doing this? Well, the reason, as we already went through, is the goal of qualifying Mary to, for mass health is so that her burn rate on her money can be reduced because she'll be in the nursing home at the mass health rate. What are the costs of this? Well, to, it, this varies by, um, by um, D4C pool trust administrator. Uh, application fees are between $750 and $2,000. There's an annual money management fee, which they charge, which just like if you were had your money managed by an a, a money manager. They're gonna charge one or two or 3% as a money management fee, uh, but they're gonna be earning interest on your money also. Um, and then finally, at the end of the day, uh, if there are any funds that are left in the D4C pool trust, before MassHealth Mass Health's lien even gets paid, the nursing home, or excuse me, the D4C is allowed to keep a percentage of that money. Depending on how long they've had the money, it will be between 5 and 25%. What can the money be used for? Anything that could benefit Mary. Uh, right off the top, uh, by the way, since Mary still owns the house in this case, it could be pay, used to pay the household bills, the insurance, the taxes, all the expenses of the house. Because remember, once Mary is on Mass Health, her social security check, which had been helping to pay those bills, is now all going to the nursing home. It could be used to pay for better equipment for Mary at the nursing home, for physical therapy, which typically isn't going to get paid for by Mass Health, um, for better food. You can have meals catered. You can have more privacy. You can buy a flat screen TV for Mary. You can do a whole number of things. All these extras that Mary would otherwise not have any of if she had spent down all of her money and then qualified for Mass Health after she was broke. So the funds can be used for any number of things. The other place the money can go is into an annuity. What kind of annuity? The same one like, as the one, like the one that Frank bought. The one that we'll call it that is irrevo irrevocable and unamendable, unamendable, calls for equal monthly payments over a term shorter than her life expectancy. Um, Mass Health will have a lien on any of the remaining payments that haven't been paid while she's alive. The current interest rates on these is terrible. You earn about 1% in interest, which is dreadful. The only reason you would buy this annuity is in order to qualify for Mass Health, in order to get that countervailing benefit. Finally, let me tell you a strategy that in this case Mary would probably want to use. She'd probably want to take her hundred or $400,000, use $288,000 of it to buy a four-year annuity. That is four years or 48 payments. That means that over those four years, um, mass or, or, or the nursing home will be getting paid this extra $6,000 in addition to Mary's income of $2,000. The total will therefore be $8,000, right? As a result of that, um, mass, or, or there will be no accruing Mass Health lien because remember, uh, once Mary was on Mass Health, Mary had to pay all of her income, in this case $8,000 a month to the nursing home. Mass Health would pay all the, re all the rest, but at the Mass Health rate, the nursing home bill is only $8,000. So in this case, as a result of buying this annuity, Mary is paying the nursing home the entire amount of the Mass Health rate and there is no lien. 
At the end of four years, there's no lien, therefore, on the remaining assets, including the house and the remaining whatever is remaining of the cash, the $122,000, which get put into the D4C. 122 plus 288 equals $400,000. So, the only remaining problem is if you're married and you're on the islands, there is a cap on the value of the house that you can have and, pre and protect it. Not on the value, but on the equity that you can have and protect it. And that cap is around a million dollars. So if Mary has a house worth more than a million dollars, she's going to need to reduce her equity. Probably the easiest way to do that is to take out a reverse mortgage. That can be done with a reverse mortgage company or with the family, a private reverse mortgage. Um, so I know we've covered a lot of material. If you have any more questions, please you know, check, check us out. Um, this, this show is shown on YouTube as well as on, our face, on Facebook. Um, you can find us on YouTube at Elder Law Frank and Mary. Uh, if you need to reach me and you have any questions, please give me a call anytime at 508-860-1470. Our goal is to help you sleep better at night. I hope this will. Thank you very much and we'll talk to you next month.